Jesus told us that we need to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And this requires us to study what that leaven is. So we are aware of it and we can avoid it. I invite you to turn your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 23 as we continue our study on the seven woes to the Pharisees. And we're going to take one of the woes here today in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 14. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. In this woe, there is an important lesson for us to learn. And that is in regards to covetousness. Jesus says here to the scribes and the Pharisees, Woe to them because they devour widows' houses. They solicit the property or the income from the property of an individual and they devour it upon themselves and then they make a religious make religious expressions as a pretense to cover up this attitude and you'll find that in many religions there is a grabbing for money and it is covered over with a, a cloak of godliness. And widows who love the Lord believe that they do all these things and it's all good. When Jesus is saying that these hypocrites are doing it wrong. We need to be aware of the problem. The problem was not in the widow. The problem lies in the religious people. So there is important lessons for us to learn. I read a quote from Desire of Ages, page 614. And here the pen of inspiration quotes this text. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. The Pharisees had great influence with the people and of this they took advantage to serve their own interests. They gained the confidence of pious widows and then represented it as a duty for them to devote their property to religious purposes. Having secured control of their money, the wily schemers use it for their own benefit. To cover their dishonesty, they offer long prayers in public and make a great show of piety. This hypocrisy, Christ declared, would bring them the greater damnation. The same rebuke falls upon many in our day who make a high profession of piety. Their lives are stained by selfishness and avarice, yet they throw over it a garment of seeming purity and thus for a time deceive their fellow men. But they cannot deceive God. He reads every purpose of the heart and will judge every man according to his deeds. Christ unsparingly condemns abuses, but he was careful not to lessen obligation. He rebuked the selfishness that extorted and misapplied the widow's gift. At the same time, he commended the widow who brought her offering for God's treasury. Man's abuse of the gift could not turn God's blessing from the giver. So this woe upon the Pharisees for us to learn from is not in regards to giving to God's cause. It's in regards to the religious mentality that solicits money from people. And that's what we want to address here. So that in all our dealings, we can 
follow the, the direction of Christ and beware of it and avoid it. Because we don't want to have a greater damnation amongst us. Luke chapter 10, it, turn your Bibles there to Luke chapter 10 and verse 2 to 4. And we read something interesting here. When Jesus sends out his disciples, he gives them ex express instruction here in Luke chapter 10. And reading in verse 2 through to 4. In regards to missionary work, he says, Therefore he said unto them, to the disciples, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. And then notice what Jesus says in verse 4. Very interesting. Carry neither purse, nor scrip, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. Interesting instruction here for his, for his disciples that are to go out and evangelize the world. He gives express instruction. Don't take your purse and don't take your scrip. Don't take an extra pair of shoes. And don't salute men by the way. What does he mean by that? Here, these things, these, each item prevents men from performing the gospel duties correct. When people go loaded with money, the mindset is, is altered. When we surrender everything we have for God's cause, and although we may have monetary funds, but in our mind, if everything is as if we have nothing, then we will do God's service. But then it says, don't take your scrip. Now, a scrip was a leather bag that was carried to take donations or food or, or beggars used it to, to ask for money. And so he's saying, when you go, don't take that either. Don't take your script. Don't go around soliciting money off people. And don't take your shoes. And I believe this means an extra pair of shoes because the Bible says, blessed is, are those that the shoes that, we, that, um, that bring the gospel and that we're to be shod with the shoes of peace. But don't take all your stuff. Don't carry around extra than what you really need. And then it says, don't salute men by the way. Don't get caught up in relationships that is not part of the program that you're going for. The apostle says, I determine not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He, in all his social activities, there was one purpose and that was to uplift Christ. It wasn't to get engaged in lots of friendships and be bogged down trying to maintain your friendships just for the sake of friendships. We should only be maintaining the friendships that are friendships because of Jesus. And then you can maintain them at the same time as maintaining Jesus. And so here we have a few examples here of the apostles going forth and they did not solicit money. You can turn your Bibles to... 2 Corinthians 11. And here the Apostle Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church and he is, he is jealous over them because there was some other people coming in and preaching error and he was jealous with a godly jealousy over them that, that they would be in, in spouse to Christ as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and starting in verse 2, it says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have, I have espoused you to one husband, that I, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So here is dealing with a problem within the Corinthian church now in as he deals with this problem there are obviously other people coming in and preaching another Christ and notice what he refers to himself uh, notice what he um, 
directs the mind to about his own ministry as evidence of his genuine um, love for them. It says, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom ye have not pre- which we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chief apostles. So he's saying, I was, I was one of the, I'm one of the top apostles here. And then he says, because he's speaking uh, about himself, he says, but though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge. So whatever it seems like he's talking about himself, and people include he's lifting himself up, he's, he's actually not meaning that. He's trying to get to the point of the discerning between a false apostle and, and, and his, his own work. He says, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted? Because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely. I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you. And so will I keep myself. So what does he say? He says, I came to you, to the Corinthian church, and I was robbing or taking wages from another church. I wasn't ministering to them. I was ministering to you. And in everything I did not ask anything from you. Every necessity was supplied to me from other people. And he said, and this is the way I'm going to keep myself. And then we read in verse um, verse, uh, 13, For such are false apostles. Now this is a contrast. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing that if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So Christ said, talking to the Pharisees, this hypocrisy, he said, they will receive the greater damnation. Because the command of Jesus was for them to go out and to minister freely to the people. Not to go there and start soliciting money and all these things off people. If someone comes to you asking for your money, that's not the, the, the hallmark of, a, of an apostle of Christ. Notice what Acts says in Acts chapter 8. When we're talking about this issue of soliciting money. And notice here the example of the Apostle Peter in Acts 8. Acts chapter 8, verse 18 through to 20. And here, And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. What did the Apostle Peter say? You thought that the gift of God was going to be purchased with money. You know, any offerings and, and tithes that are ever paid is not to secure the gift of God. Gift, the gift of God comes without money and without price. And the service of all God's followers are given freely. Freely they have received and freely they will give. And so the, the apostles were very clear on this, that this monetary situation was not to be the forethought of their mind whenever they went 
And unfortunately today, many religious groups are always thinking about the dollars. And it is not to be our consideration. It says in 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2. And it says, Feed the flock of God which is among you. Here's the sharing to church elders. The Apostle Peter is exhorting the church elders. Feed the flock of God which is among you. Take the oversight thereof. Not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So, in all our work, we need to be aware of this. And so, people have always thought, well, how does a church get more money? And in the human devising of how to get more money, there has become, in our day, many schemes that are out there today to secure money from the people to the church. And it is clear that many of them are wrong. In fact, there is only two methods that God has, has approved of. And that is tithes and offerings, free will offerings, and the sales of books that cost to print to support the workers literature evangelists these methods are approved of god but i'd like to read some of the methods that are not approved of god so we can be aware of the leaven of the pharisees i read from councils on stewardship page 201 it says we see the churches of our day encouraging feasting gluttony by the suppers, fairs, dances and festivals gotten up for the purpose of gathering means into the church treasury. Here is a method invented by carnal minds to secure means without sacrificing. Such an example makes an impression upon the minds of youth. They notice that lotteries and fairs and games are sanctioned by the church. They think there is something fascinating in this way of obtaining means. A youth is surrounded by temptations. He enters the bowling alley, the gambling saloon. He sees the sport. He sees the money being taken by the one who wins. This looks enticing. It seems an easy way to obtain money than by earnest work, which requires persevering energy and strict economy. He imagines that there can be no harm in this, for similar games have been resorted in order to obtain means for the benefit of the church then why should he not help himself in this way? He has little means which he ventures to invest, thinking it may bring in quite a sum. Whether he gains or loses, he is on the downward road to ruin. But it is the example of the church that lead into false paths. Now I remember when I was young, we had a church fate. And one thing that really interested me when I was little was the jar of jelly beans that you had to guess how many there were. And you had to pay to make a guess. And if your guess was the closest or the right one, you got that whole jar of jelly beans. And as the church was doing this, and I was very interested in it when I was little. And the churches used these sort of means to gain money. And it is not approved of God. It says, further on, it says, Let us stand clear of all these church corruptions and festivals and dissipations which have a demoralizing influence upon young and old. We have no right to throw over them a cloak of sanctity. Because the means is to be used for church purposes. Such offerings are lame and diseased and, can, and bear the curse of God. They are the price of souls. The pulpit may defend festivals, dancing and lotteries and fairs and luxurious feasts to obtain means for church purposes. 
But let us participate in none of these things, for if we do, God's displeasure will be upon us. We do not propose to appeal to the lust of the appetite or resort to carnal amusements as an inducement to Christ's professed followers to give of the means which God has entrusted to them. If they do not give willingly for the love of Christ, the offering will in no case be acceptable to God. So there are a, uh, churches often run um, concerts and all these entertainers and then they hand the offering bag around. All that money is cursed. It can't be used of God because God wants the heart and not the money alone. It says another um, paragraph down in 202, paragraph 2, it says, In professedly Christian gatherings, Satan throws a religious garment over delusive pleasures and unholy revelings to give them the appearance of sanctity. And the conscience of many are quietened because means are raised to defray church expenses. Men refuse to give for the love of God, but for the love of pleasure and the indulgence of appetite for selfish considerations, they will part with their money. It is because there is not power in the lessons of Christ upon, the, uh, upon benevolence and in his example and the grace of God upon the hearts to lead men to glorify God with their substance that such a course may be resorted to in order to sustain the church. Such things need to be done because the gospel is not being preached. God's, uh, the people aren't giving their hearts to God. Because when people do give their heart to God, then it is only a natural course for them to pay their offerings free will. And so we have an example here in Mark chapter 12. Mark, chap Mark chapter 12 and verse 38 to 42. And he, Jesus, said unto to them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplace and the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms at feasts which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive the greater damnation. So here he's talking of display, of pomp, of pretended piety and innocent people are tricked by all this apparent loveliness that is displayed on, on all the missionary reports and wow, it's all so good. And they, they give because they've been flattered by these men. The greater damnation is upon the rulers and the church leaders. But notice that Jesus does not condemn the giving of offering. And this is not the purpose of our study. Our purpose of our study is to beware of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. To be aware of it. That we will not engage in any activity in our ministry that we do that will be out of character with Jesus Christ. And so when people love Jesus, this is how it continues in verse 41. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow. And she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto his disciples and said unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow has cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance. But she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. So as he rebukes this pretended piety of taking money he then shows an example of a small amount of money that is given with everything she gave her whole life when she gave those two mites 
She came in to worship God. And she said, Lord, I'm going to give you my whole heart. And she gave those two mites. If she didn't give her heart, did she give everything? Did she give all of her living? So we see here that what God is actually looking for is free will offerings that come from the heart from Jesus Christ. And that can only come when the message that is shared is Christ-centered. And when that happens, then you don't have to worry about anything. All the people of God have to worry about is presenting Jesus Christ to the world. You don't have to solicit from anyone. don't have to point it out to people. We don't have to take our script around and ask for money. We simply preach Jesus Christ and there is an offering box, free will and as God's word comes before them, they see the beauty of Jesus and their obligation to him. And they are more than willing to show that. It says in Councils on Stewardship, page 198, all that we do is to be done willingly. We are to bring our offerings with joy and gratitude saying as we present them of thine of thy own we freely give thee the most costly service we can render is but meager compared to the gift of god to our world christ is a gift every day god gave him to the world and he graciously takes the gifts entrusted to his human agents for the advancement of his work in the world Thus we show that we recognize and acknowledge that everything belongs to God, absolutely and entirely. The offering from the heart that loves, God delights to honor, giving it highest efficiency in service for Him. If someone gives two mites with all their heart, it will go further in the cause of God than someone who gives grudgingly a hundred dollars. Because God will bless that amount. And hasn't that been the case of the, of the story of the widow? How many people have heard that story? And so those two mites have been an example to the world that has motivated people to serve the Lord with their substance. So she has done far more than the people that we don't know about who gave in much more because God used it to multiply to his service. More millions and millions of dollars that you'd never even think of came from those two mites because of what she did and how it was recorded. So let us never underestimate the heart service that we can give to God. And it's not about the amount, it's about the heart. And then it says, if we have given our hearts to Jesus, we also shall bring our gifts to him. Our gold and our silver, our most precious earthly possessions, our highest mental and spiritual endowments will be freely devoted to him who loved us and gave himself for us. And then it says that giving grudgingly mocks God. And so in this lesson that we want to gain from this woe to the Pharisee is that we need to be conscious of how we engage with the Word of God and that we continually uphold Jesus Christ and motivate people from the heart and leave the rest to God because it's His work, not ours. And when we do this, we will obey the Lord when he sent them out and says, don't take your purse or your script or your shoes or be content with, your, with what you have and serve God with everything you have and God will do the multiplication. God will move upon the hearts for people to give according to his movements. So I pray that we can do this and be blessed of God in all that we do and be aware and avoid the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Amen.